All right, sounds good. Uh, thanks, Dale, and thanks, Bert, for that uh, that introduction. And yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, there, there's a lot that's been happening that has happened over the last five, six years in the blue tech space. And what I'm hoping to cover in this presentation is both what's happening from a national perspective and then specifically what's taking place here in New England and some of the things that are going to impact uh, the CAPE in terms of this subset of the blue economy, which is blue technology. So with that, um, what, what I'm going to do is this, this outline looks like there's a lot in it, but some of these I'm going to cover quickly. First, just so that we're all on the same page, I'm going to talk about what is the blue economy. Um, I'm going to talk about New England and the blue economy with a little bit of a historical perspective and sort of why uh, we've got such a dense and diverse uh, blue tech ecosystem here. Uh, one of the big emerging opportunities that's getting a lot of attention, both from the public as well as the industry, is offshore wind. So I, I want to talk about that. And then look at some of these emerging um, areas of interest that Dale explained that whether it's the Build Back Better regional challenge uh, that the Biden administration launched uh, last year, which is going to be uh, mean uh, roughly a billion dollars worth of funding uh, to 20 to 30 municipalities and regions around the U.S. And uh, I'll talk specifically about some of those blue initiatives uh, and then talk about challenges. So this is one thing that hasn't changed since the last time I talked uh, at um, the Cape Cod Technology Council, which is workforce development. Uh, the One of the challenges in blue tech is that you know, there, there's a need for talented engineers and mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. And, and so the good news is most of the blue tech companies, in fact, all of the blue tech companies that I know, whether they're making vehicles or sensors or, um, or, or other technologies are hiring. The, the bad news is that some of those companies are having a challenge finding those employees and then there's a diversity issue there uh, as well, which, which I'll touch on. And then investment, uh, which is an emerging area. So, um, and then some thoughts about what's next. So what is the blue economy? The blue economy is economic activity that's tied to the water. And so on Cape Cod, that's it's, it's pretty much everything that you think it is. And that's in tourism, boating and aquaculture. So shellfish, mussels, oysters, things like that, fishing and more. And a subset of the blue economy where I'm going to focus this presentation is blue technology, which are the systems that address the critical areas and additional sectors like defense, ocean monitoring, energy, and exploration. So on Cape Cod, the blue economy encompasses things like advanced research through the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, MBL or uh, University of Chicago that is at the nexus of traditional marine biology and biotech and uh, traditional biotech and biopharma. You've got companies like uh, Hydroid, which uh, is sort of a world leader in marine robotics, companies like McLean and Dr. Hanjo looks like uh, is on, on the call today, uh, making sensors and, uh, and other companies that are developing systems uh, both directly and indirectly for blue tech. Company like Onset, for instance, is developing uh, sensors that are being used by an oyster tech startup so that when oysters are harvested, they drop a sensor in uh, to, you know, to, to track, essentially to uh, aid in the traceability of those oysters from harvest to distribution point, whether that's a restaurant or a wholesaler or a retailer. So a lot happening. And historically, if we look at you know, blue tech, uh, the blue tech economy in New England, We've got, we've had historically a strong defense sector focused, and that's for a number of reasons I'll talk about in a moment. But um, you know, it's it's um, also true that we have a strong traditional fisheries uh, here in Massachusetts, particularly. We have the Port of Gloucester, but also the Port of New Bedford, which is the largest port in the country in terms of the dollar value of the landed catch. And so, when we look at you know traditional fisheries, they have a significant impact on the economy and from a technology standpoint, 
There are emerging areas around you know, using robotic systems and sensors to enable the fishing fleets uh, that um, essentially that, that we see in, in places like Europe that have uh, adopted robotic systems and sensors and, and other platforms uh, much more readily. And so the U.S. fleets have been slow to adopt the technology, but it's, it's an emerging area that we're going to see uh, an increased interest in. And there's a group uh, that's been formed in New Bedford called the New Bedford Ocean Cluster, which I'm not, I'm not going to uh, talk about today, but that's um, a, a uh, sort of a new group that's focused on a number of areas. Fishing is one, offshore wind is another. But one of the reasons that we have this strong ecosystem is that we have, we have these anchor institutions within the region. So we have, of course, the research institutions like the University of Rhode Island and UMass Dartmouth and even Schools like Mass Maritime Academy, which are, are now looking at ways to develop training programs, community colleges are looking at ways of developing training programs for the offshore wind industry. And Mass Maritime is also looking at that. UMass Dartmouth and URI are looking at research related to uh, marine renewable energy and, and other systems, uh, autonomous underwater vehicle platforms and, and things like that. So, but we've had two key institutions that have really driven um, both commercialization and economic activity, and they are the Navy, or more specifically, the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, but also Naval Station Newport, and to a lesser extent, the Naval War College, that bring, uh, the reason why all of the primes, the major defense contractors, have an office on Aquidneck Island, so Portsmouth, the Middletown, and Newport, is because of the Navy presence. So you have companies like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and others uh, that, that have offices there, Gen General Dynamics Mission Systems, and, and so on. And uh, because of that, you, we have this underwater robotics, uh, and the, the other anchor institution is UI. And um, the amount of commercialization activity that's come out of UI has driven um, a number of startups that, uh, that have gone on to become uh, kind of household names in the industry. And I mentioned Hydroid, McLean, uh, and others like Bluefin Robotics, which is now General Dynamics Mission Systems, Bluefin uh, Robotics, and, and which is in close proximity to the Cape. Um, and then we have these emerging opportunities like offshore wind, marine renewable energy. Um, the, the New England, uh, in New England, you may not be aware, but there are a number of you know, what are, are becoming high profile, at least in that space, uh, wave energy converter. Um, it, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I've also gotten to do over the last couple of years is serve as a reviewer for the Department of Energy's uh, wave energy converter SBIR solicitations. And, and so in New England, we have a number of uh, like a company uh, called ORPC, uh, um, which is now located in Maine, but that company ORPC actually started in the incubator that Dale and Bert mentioned uh, that, that I ran for UMass Dartmouth uh, a long time ago. But, but you have hydrokinetic uh, and uh, other uh, companies that are using water to generate power for like Resolute Marine, which is using wave energy to power desalinization plants and things like that. And the Department of Energy has been funding through their ARPA-E program and others, some of these um, uh, leading edge or cutting edge companies that are forming right here in Southern New England. So uh, in uh, particularly in New Bedford um, and uh, autonomous surface ve uh, vehicles, uh, ASVs or, or U uh, USVs, uncrewed unmanned surface vehicles are also uh, another emerging industry that's taking, that's uh, taking shape here. Uh, and then enabling technologies like battery and power systems uh, that um, companies like um, Open Water Power, which was an aluminum oxide battery system that was uh, being incubated in Greentown Labs in Somerville, uh, was bought by L3, uh, now L3 Harris, uh, because, uh, again, battery and power systems is an enabling technology that allows for companies that are making vehicles or sensors uh, again, to, to better power them and, and something that the industry is looking at. So blue tech, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, sort of policymakers and the industry are taking a close look, have been taking a close look at 
the offshore wind industry. And as you uh, likely all know, you know, the first wind for, uh, operating offshore wind farm in the United States uh, that's operating now and generating electricity is uh, off of Block Island, Rhode Island. And um, in fact, uh, Gina Raimondo, the governor of Rhode Island, before she went off to becoming uh, the, the secretary of uh, the Commerce Secretary for the U.S., um, announced that she wanted in, uh, in 2020, uh, it, it, she announced in 2020 that in 10 years, she wanted uh, Rhode Island to be 100% powered by renewable energy. And of course, that includes you know, terrestrial solar and terrestrial wind, but of, of course, it also includes offshore wind uh, as part of that, that formula. So um, the reason that it's generating so much buzz is that companies like Vineyard Wind have made significant investments in the port of New Bedford in terms of uh, you know, economic commitment in, uh, to hiring employees. Orsted uh, at the Blue Innovation Symposium in 2020 announced that they would be opening their US Innovation Center uh, in Providence uh, to encourage startup activity in the offshore wind space. And the regions, as I mentioned before, the regions, colleges and universities are now developing education and training programs to support the industry. And, um, and we've already had significant port infrastructure development uh, spending through the Mass Clean Energy Center, the state uh, and, uh, and others in the port of New Bedford to help uh, the port become a staging area for the, offshore, the deployment of offshore wind turbines and, and such. Um, but we also have uh, Brayton Point uh, in Somerset, which is a former power plant uh, that uh, a, a couple, uh, two of the local legislators, the state representative and state senator uh, from uh, the region are looking to bring funding in to develop Brayton Point as a potential landing spot for uh, the cables that, that will uh, be needed for that offshore wind, those offshore wind platforms. So, and lastly, the reason why economic development officials uh, and um, policymakers are so interested in, uh, in the industry is as predicted uh, to create uh, 16, you know, more than 16,000 jobs in the Northeast. Uh, and it, it is expected to be a long-term opportunity that you know, from the work that's gonna be needed to do the surveying and the engineering work through the deployment and staging, again, the, uh, the actual deployment of the turbines, through once those turbines are out in the ocean, um, the servicing work that will be needed to upkeep the turbines and, um, and, and you know, again, make sure that they're operational is a long-term opportunity that is likely uh, decades, uh, will, will be a decades long uh, opportunity. So, and, and um, at first, uh, yeah, I was sort of slow to look at offshore wind as a opportunity for marine tech. But now, um, when I was still at UMass, uh, I was able through uh, some funding uh, through the Clean Energy Center to stand up the first marine renewable energy conference um, at, the, at UMass Dartmouth and at the center. And increasingly, we brought in offshore wind um, firms to talk about what opportunities there are for the technology industry and and. And there's a lot, and there's quite a bit that uh, that that work is going to um, mean for uh, uh, our service firms, as well as you know the engineering firms, the surveyors, uh, as well as those technology developers, which which I'll talk about later. So, the blue economy is you know kind of we segue to where we are today in blue tech, uh, and you know when when we went to conferences pre 2020. Um, at you know, uh, whether it's the Marine uh, Huey's Center for Marine Robotics's uh, Entre Marine Robotics's Entrepreneurship Day or otherwise, you would hear refrains or these tropes like, uh, and you still hear these. Uh, more people have walked on the surface of the moon than the bottom of the ocean. We've mapped more of the surface of Mars than we have our own oceans, and these things are still true. But but there's there's kind of a change in in the discussion which I'll talk about. But but back then, there was little direct support for blue tech founders. There were hardly any accelerator programs that were really there weren't any deep tech accelerator programs uh, that were focused on blue, um, because if you know the, the blue technology, uh, and maybe I didn't mention this, it's it's challenging 
to get things to survive under the water. You know, that for, in, from it, it, not only that, but it's hard to get you know to communicate with things that are under the water versus space where you're dealing with one atmosphere. You're dealing with you know the ability to communicate. Um, you're not dealing with the pressure issues, the corrosion. Uh, and the harsh environment of of the re- the normal ocean, never mind uh, uh, you know uh, tough environments like the Arctic or um, or other places where it's just challenging to get things to survive under the water or on the surface, uh, buoys and things like that. So there were a little support for blue tech founders, and um, and almost all blue tech startups at the time were bootstrapped. Or were operating off of SBIR funding. So you know, a group of talented engineers uh, went off, created a company. They got some SBIR funding. They used that, uh, it, you know, to uh, to get to the point where they were driving organic sales. And then, you know, they either got acquired or they they uh, grew organically. So today, um, you know, and by today, I mean over the last couple of years, the the conversation has changed quite a bit, where now we have a better understanding of the ocean's um, impact on climate change and the climate, so that the the oceans have a direct and measurable impact on our climate and vice versa. For the first time, really, um, at the the UN's climate conference in in Glasgow, Scotland, a couple months ago, um, the oceans, really, was the climate change's impact on the oceans, and so ocean acidification and things like that. But the ocean's uh, role in climate change was brought up uh, as uh, as a discussion point, which is fairly new. And um, uh, you know, and now we're seeing, of course, the mercenary thing. You know, sort of uh, the dollar v- values. I'm seeing things like our oceans are worth at least twenty four trillion dollars and could potentially be the fourth or fifth largest economy. Um, I, I actually pulled this from a, a, a pitch deck from a, a company. Uh, based in the UK, that's looking to raise a round of funding that I'm meeting with later this morning, um, and um, I pitched it because it's 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 a big number, and and uh, uh, and and sort of you know if it's to believe, uh, again you know what we're seeing is more blue tech startups are using you know kind of again what the blue economy um, and some of the blue economic. Uh, and investment activity that's taking place, I'll talk about later, uh, as examples of of why blue tech now is an investable uh, area. And then now, today, there's lots of support for blue tech firms. And you've got accelerator programs, incubators, you've got mentor-based programs, and you've got direct support organizations, groups like 401 Tech Bridge in Rhode Island that is a Navy-funded uh, and uh, what here in the uh, in Massachusetts it's called MEP uh, in Rhode Island it's called Polaris but it's a NIST funded initiative that works with manufacturers and and there particularly composites manufacturers and others to help them not only scale but to make relationships with the U.S. Navy and others that that could use their uh, you know uh, systems their tech uh, their kit and, and things like that so there's a lot of support today and. Because of some of the exit activity that's taken place within the industry, we're now seeing venture capital, institutional investors, you know, fa- and angels, including you know, th- family offices, traditional VCs, and angels, uh, as well as individual investors who are just interested in the space, now starting to take a very close look at what's happening in the blue tech world. So. Over the last seven years, there's been a proliferation of activity and new organizations to support blue tech firms in New England, but really across the U.S. And one of the things I've been saying for probably the last time I spoke at the Cape Cod Tech Council is that New England has one of the most diverse and dense blue tech ecosystems in the world. And you know, other other ecosystems have different focus. If you look at Gulfport, Mississippi, for instance, you've got a you 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 have and had a strong focus on offshore oil and gas, which we we don't have except for the robotics and sensor companies that are supplying into that. But we've got a dense and diverse uh, economy. It's just one of the least organized. And when we look at places like Seattle, Washington, San Diego, Gulfport, and even Miami. Um, We're seeing uh, groups now form up, policymakers now get behind blue tech in a way that's unprecedented. 
And Rhode Island, which I'm going to talk about, uh, has now over the last year gotten really organized around blue economy and blue technology. And they've done that because this last year in 2021, the Biden administration through the U.S. Economic Development Administration launched a funding tranche called the a program called excuse me, the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. So BBRC, BBBRC. And what the BBRC is, is potentially a billion dollars of total funding for um, 20 to 30 regional coalitions, which will get um, uh, you know, a pro, you know, some of, you know, uh, up to $100 million each. Uh, and um, where, so the, the challenge was launched uh, over the summer. The deadline was in the fall, October of, of last year. Uh, the EDA received 529 applications, uh, a number of blue proposals from groups like Niracu's, uh, here, a, 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 um, a group based in uh, New England, uh, based in New Hampshire, as well as uh, the University of New Hampshire had partnered, I think, with them on that proposal. Hui and others submitted proposals there were 60 finalists. And of the 60 finalists, there were three blue focused projects. And they include uh, the state of Rhode Island, Gulfport, Mississippi, and Seattle, Washington have all won a feasibility award with a full proposal due in March. And you know, I had the pleasure of working with the state of Rhode Island on their proposal um, over the last few months, over the summer and, and into the fall. And uh, as an example, their proposal is really based on three, you know, there's three legs to the stool. The first is workforce development. They recognize that one of the challenges the industry has is in uh, attracting uh, talent, educating and attracting talent into the industry. And so they've got a workforce development piece. They also realize that testing is a key component to blue tech. And so they have a plan to, um, sensor Narragansett Bay into what they're calling a smart bay to create a smart bay initiative. And the third is to create an, uh, an innovation center called the BTIC, the Blue Tech Innovation Center on the campus at Bob Ball one of Bob Ballard's former research buildings on the Bay campus of the University of Rhode Island. So if that uh, full proposal is due in March, but if it is funded, it will have regional consequence for New England, it, it will uh, impact uh, not just Rhode Island, but it will impact Connecticut, where there's a traditional submarine building ecosystem through uh, southeastern Massachusetts and the Cape. So, so what are the challenges? The challenges are, you know, that engineers. So, good news is, again, blue tech companies are hiring. The bad news is, many of those blue tech companies are having challenges in finding the engineers uh, and the scientists that they need to work uh, in, you know, the, in the industry. And so, um, and also there's been, you know, kind of a well-recognized lack of diversity within blue tech. And, and so when we look at, you know, like, like um, you know, I, I think, you know, Dale and Bert in the introduction mentioned I, I do a lot of speaking on the topic of, of blue economies. And, and in fact, one of the conferences that I speak at is uh, a blue tech conference that takes place in Halifax, Canada, which has gotten very organized. The Canadian government has gotten very organized around blue tech. And um, there at their conference, it is um, you know, sort of um, easy to see that there's diversity or at least you know, some diversity in blue tech uh, founders uh, and uh, and some sizable or mid-sized blue tech firms that we uh, don't have by and large here in the U.S. And and so some of the things that are being looked at by groups like the Marine and Oceanographic Technology Network, um, the the Maritime Alliance out in San Diego, and even you know some of these emerging groups in Gulfport, Miami, and Seattle are looking at. Um, education at the K through 12 level. And so focusing on STEM education and also getting people, students interested in blue tech or, or you know, sort of deep tech, blue tech. Because one of the things that, that is still true today is that if you grow up on Cape Cod, 
it, it sometimes, uh, you know, um, you sometimes miss that there's actually a technology industry that's within, you know, close proximity to Hyannis or West Barnstable or Falmouth or wherever you may be growing up. And what you might look at are, you know, that, that you know, the only jobs on the Cape are service industry or the trades or, you know, landscaping and, and others. And so what happens is, is that um, the, the, the K through 12 population on the Cape, those that are going to school, will either go to four C's, uh, get an associate's degree, and then leave the Cape to get a, a, a four-year degree, or they'll leave the Cape, get a four-year degree, go to work in tech, and then won't return back to the Cape um, until they've got kids where they want to grow, you know, essentially raise the kids back on the Cape, uh, or they've got aging parents and they want to come back in kind of a combination of taking care of the aging parents and raising their kids in an environment that they grew up in and that they appreciated. And it's not until then that some of these folks realize that there actually is a tech industry, again, in Southern New England and on the Cape um, that requires people with skills. And so part of it is educating students at the K through 12 level about some of these opportunities and, and creating internships, co-ops, capstone projects throughout the spectrum. So not just colleges where you know, UMass Dartmouth, URI and others do a good job of developing co-op opportunities, capstone projects, et cetera. But we need, I think, to do a better job of, again, bringing in that K through 12 environment to at least educate them about what's happening. So the other big problem that really hasn't gone away is the fact that there, there has been a traditional lack of funding for, for equity funding for blue tech startups. As I mentioned, you know, SBIR funding, which is non-dilutive, essentially grant funding from the US government is a well-worn path to funding for blue tech companies. But it's very different getting non-dilutive grant funding from the government than it is taking equity investment. And so equity investors have been challenged. So as I put here, despite the tremendous amount of activity, hopefully I've painted a picture of uh, in the sector, promising blue tech firms are still challenged to get funding. And paradoxically, investors are having challenge and corporates, frankly, uh, in terms of acquisition activity, are having a challenge finding good investable or acquirable deals. And so there's an inefficiency that, that's in the market right now in terms of funding uh, for blue tech startups. And part of that is that venture capital firms are still pretty, pretty unaware of what the market value, you know, the valuations and what the market sizes are and potential is for the industry. And so to address that, um, last year, we got funding to create the Blue Venture Forum, which, as Dale mentioned, is it's the first venture capital forum uh, dedicated to blue tech, um, you know, as far as I know, in the world. But uh, it was, um, a, I know some of you on the line have been involved in the past with a group called SNEEF, which was the Southern New England Entrepreneurs Forum, which I chaired for a number of years. And um, and. SNEEF was a, I, I draw the parallel because we created SNEEF in the early 2000s to bring programming uh, to this startup community, a general startup community. And we would hold programs in Hyannis at one of uh, the Four Seasons uh, outreach centers uh, off of Main Street. And we would do it in Fall River at the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And, and the impetus for the creation of the Blue Venture Forum kind of came out of the understanding that there was a need uh, for blue tech companies, founders, and those that are looking to start blue tech companies uh, to connect, uh, or at least better connect with educational resources to help them understand um, better the world of equity investment, the world of working with primes or corporates. So how do you work with them? How do you partner with them? Uh, and investors. So for the investors, it's, you know, again, with a specific focus on, defense, uh, on, on tech, you know, how do we identify, scale up blue technology companies and connect them with these corporate and investor partners in, in sectors like defense, environment, and energy? So, you know, again, previously, the, the focus in the discussion was really geared towards um, defense tech. Today, particularly under the Biden administration, we're seeing a uh, shift to groups like NOAA, 
and uh, and even the U.S. Department of Energy that's funding a lot of you know again renewable energy initiatives, particularly with a with a uh, with a marine focus, so wave energy converters, hydrokinetic technologies, and and so on. So, in investment, what we're seeing is blue tech will continue to be uh, important to the region's growth, and we'll see key drivers, including Hui research institutions, the Navy, NOAA, the Department of Energy. We'll see offshore wind play a major and lasting impact on the region. Groups like Woods Hole Group. Uh, and other companies that provide services, engineering services, uh, survey work, engineering work, et cetera, will see, um, and, and even companies like Thayer Mahan, uh, which is a company based in Connecticut that is in the underwater autonomous vehicle space, will um, we'll see companies like that contracting with companies like Worstead, Vineyard Wind, Mayflower, and, and so on. Um, investors are actively looking for opportunities in autonomous underwater vehicles, surface vehicles, sensors, and related platforms, but also, so those are direct blue tech companies, but we're also seeing enabling technologies like, as I mentioned, battery and power, data analytics, machine learning, and communication platforms, acoustical uh, uh, communication platforms. And lastly, you know, the opportunities are for organizations to partner and collaborate to support you know, our collective membership. So, you know, research and development, product development and testing, there's a lot happening within the ecosystem. And I, I mentioned the fact that New England has a dense and diverse ecosystem, but we're very unorganized in terms of connecting those nodes. I look at that, not, you know, that, that is an issue, but I look at that as an opportunity. It's an opportunity for all of us to collectively collaborate and for successful firms to work with fledgling founders to help them uh, to, to get going and get started. And, um, and uh, a plug, uh, uh, February 22nd through the 24th, um, we, we organized the largest blue tech conference in New England uh, called the Blue Innovation Symposium. You can learn more at blueinnovationsymposium.com. Uh, brings together, hopefully, you know, hopefully this year, uh, uh, variants and COVID be darned. Uh, hopefully we bring a good delegation of uh, companies together. Uh, in the past, we've, we've brought you know, roughly 300 companies. This year, we have companies like Saab, uh, uh, Dartmouth Ocean Technologies, Boston Engineering, Teledyne Marine, and others who have signed on to participate. So um, look forward to possibly seeing you there. And um, so Dale, I think I'm, I'm in time limit. Uh, and- it awesome. Uh, and, and uh, if not, I, I have uh, a couple slides about uh, blue tech investment, uh, sort of the then and now, which I'm happy to go into. Uh, I will, uh, for those of you on the call, I will share these slides with Bert and Dale so that they can distribute them. Uh, some of the slides I have at the end uh, highlight uh, you know, some of the investment activity like uh, Dive Technologies based in Quincy that's gotten $9.5 million in venture capital funding. So far, Ocean based in California raised $49 million in a uh, Series A round. And Saildrone, which is a company uh, also in California that just raised $100 million in a Series C round. And, um, and we have companies like C-Track, the founder of C-Track, um, and uh, Salient Prediction, so, which is a, also a, a HUI researcher as well as uh, Cape-based company are uh, speakers at this year's conference. So look forward to seeing you there. And Dale, I'll I'll stop. I could, you know, as I think some people on the call know, I could go on for uh, a long time on this topic, uh, but hopefully I covered the high notes anyway. Yeah, that was, that was really great. Um, there's no questions right now in the chat. So folks, this is your meeting. Um, Toby's here to answer any questions we have or you have for it. So um, let's get them in the chat. And I mean, I have a million questions. I, I could probably take up a whole hour um, while folks are putting their questions in. I just have one question. The um, So if you're a traditional, if you have a traditional skill, like a uh, structural engineering, electrical engineering, something like that, are, they, are, are those types of skills being taught in a marine setting in college? And if not, if you are doing that somewhere else now, how hard is it to like 
engage in say electrical engineering and the marine in the uh, in the blue tech world? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, so from you know, the, like it's a good question uh, because you know if you look at the different skill sets that companies like, for instance, I spoke with a a founder of a of a blue tech company that they're making a um, a vehicle, an underwater autonomous vehicle, and they hired uh, over the last uh, six months an electrical engineer uh, and a mechanical engineer, and they're outsourcing their software development. They're they're hoping to develop an open source uh, software platform, which is you know kind of unusual for the industry. But they're they're developing the software using kind of on the shelf tools like. Um, this thing called an Unreal Engine. Unreal is a game, you know, what's traditionally known uh, in the gaming. It's an engine that, uh, a, game, uh, a software engine that drives a lot of games uh, today, but they're using it because there's a, a, a AR, a, an augmented reality, virtual reality component to what they're developing and they're tying that uh, software. And so what we're seeing is that those skills that companies need are, again, electrical, mechanical, and software, uh, and companies are filling those positions as best as they can. So some are hiring, those that have funding are hiring directly. Those that don't are hiring contractors uh, and, um, and others are outsourcing. So they're, they're finding a firm who will develop, uh, you know, they, or, or you know, do the engineering or do the software development. So it, uh, it, it sometimes, depending on where somebody is in the career, if this is the question, it's sometimes challenging to port skills uh, you know, literally and figuratively speaking, into the marine environment because it is different. You know, to, to get things uh, at the Center for Innovation Entrepreneurship at UMass Dartmouth. Uh, yeah, I was fortunate to have a machine shop that was run by a, a um, you know essentially an engineer who had capability in uh, you know ha- getting things to survive under the water, and so he knew you know, what materials to use or where things needed to be, things like buoyancy, which is a big thing and, uh, and other, you know, like, you know, so con- where the con tower should be uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, so again, you know, it's, uh, but those skills uh, are not always easily portable. Uh, and so, you know, again, what we're seeing is, you know, kind of there's a, a velvet rope, a bit of a velvet rope to the industry. And, and part of, I think, I believe, an opinion part of, of dealing with that is educating students about what blue tech means and uh, getting STEM education. I know you know there's a lot of talk about that in early, especially to encourage diverse populations into um, uh, diversity into the industry. Okay, great. We, we do have a couple of questions and comments here. Um, what one comment is um, could you comment on the United Nations Ocean Decade, the U.S. Ocean Decade, and the related Ocean Shots program. Um, is that something that um, you could comment on or? Uh, yeah, that... I mean, yeah. So, I mean, like, you know, as I mentioned at the at COP, like, um, I haven't had enough coffee. It was either 26 or 16. Somebody's going to correct me on that. But at the at the U.N.'s climate change conference that, that, uh, that took place just a few months ago, Again, you know, that, that it's an example of oceans were talked about, and uh, it's an example of the dialogue that's happening, because really, you know, if you look at, at um, again, particularly New England, the vehicle companies like Hydroid, Ocean Server, which is now uh, owned by L3 Harris, uh, Bluefin, GD Mission Systems, or Dive Technologies even, those companies are like, if, you know, if you asked me three years ago, what, where's the market for un, unmanned underwater vehicles, uncrewed autonomous vehicles, uh, it, w- uh, it would be the military, the Navy primarily. But today what we're seeing is a diversification of markets. We, we are seeing commercial play, players. We, we, we're seeing researchers, which is a small portion of, of that. Um, but we're, we're now seeing groups like NOAA. NOAA has $280 million uh, proposed in their their budget for increased censoring alone, and so that's that's a big budget increase. And, and part of what's driving it is you know the is is the Biden administration, but but the you know kind of the global. It's important, Dale, to, um, that these things are important. Uh, like the 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 uh, the UN initiatives are important to driving the global dialogue because you know in the U.S. 
the dialogue has been you know, sort of strictly focused on on the dollars, right? So the, like, you know, the market is the military, so therefore we're gonna develop a military system. And we've been talking about those vehicles and sensors having uses in environmental monitoring, coastal monitoring, ocean monitoring, et cetera. But the, you know, sort of the money, the bread is buttered on the military, what has been buttered on the military side. And so um, as we now understand, uh, for instance, things like, you know, salinity and temperature in the oceans um, in front of a hurricane impact the, the severity of a hurricane, or those things also impact the severity of rainfall, you know, inland rainfall, never mind coastal rainfall. We now are understanding, you know, sort of uh, collectively how important the oceans are, and we have to better understand our oceans in the way to, and we don't uh, understand the oceans today. So I, I look at it as kind of an opportunity for us to collectively, you know, develop the systems, you know, kind of the next generation of systems that will, will get us to better understand the oceans and then drive policy. You know, that plastics has gotten a lot of, um, you know, sort of uh, tr traction media coverage, uh, plastic waste, microplastics and things like that in the ocean. But, you know, but they're, 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 but that's not the only issue, obviously, impacting the oceans. And and uh, but it happens to be one that the public can understand. Uh, and you can do things like, you know, again, post. Not, I'm not downplaying it, but post pictures of turtles with straws in their nose and things like that, and get the the public to to um, understand that this problem. is. Yeah. So and and some of it because we have not really mapped the oceans or understand our oceans, it's tougher to get that visual, you know, those visual communication pieces. So long story short, um, the dialogue at, at the, the global level driven by the UN, the EU, uh, you know, included, uh, but the US um, is important to driving um, startup activity really at the, at the end of the day. Great, thank you for addressing that. We've got a few more questions that rolled in here and about 12 minutes left. So I think we have enough time to get through all these. Um, Eldon asks, could you give a little bit more detail or uh, any insight on uh, blue tech for AI or data analytics? Oh yeah. Yeah. I could go. Yeah. So that, Another hour. Where I'm, yeah, no, yeah. Just really quick. Uh, that is one of the big, you know, opportunities that we are, we're seeing, we are seeing a lot of startup activity. But we're also seeing, you know, acquisition activity, you know, like traditional AI ML companies that have nothing to do with blue are being acquired by blue tech firms like Kraken Robotics based in St. John's, Newfoundland, bought uh, a Brazilian AI ML company last year and, because they're looking to um, ena better enable their sonar and other systems. And so it, it's, the yeah, to, to be short, it is a big opportunity that has not been uh, fully addressed. There's there's still opportunity for AI ML companies to look closely at sonar, you know, like you know, Klein, um, you know, um, uh, 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 one of the big sonar companies is a sponsor of this year's Blue Innovation Symposium, and uh, I, I mentioned Far Sounder and others. Um, you, you're going to see a real need uh, for AI ML companies to partner or for those companies to develop AI ML capabilities. So I, I, I think it's one of the big emerging sectors. So Eldon, that's a good question. All right, great, thank you. Uh, question, um, sort of a specific question here that came in early. Uh, does anyone know, or do you know, if anything came from the Cape Cod Canal tidal power generation effort? Yeah, I, so I just talked to them yesterday and they've got their first, you know, deployment with a company called. So, if you're talking about the Marine Renewable Energy Collaborative, which cr created that test platform, so um, on the canal, they they um, um, you know, so they, they have some challenges, regulatory challenges right now. Which you know, that, but the um, the 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 big news is is that they're, they're actually seeing um, you know some activity by uh, companies that are developing hydrokinetic systems and so on that. Um, are exciting for the industry. As I mentioned, marine renewable energy uh, as a sector is one that's also growing by virtue of the ARPA-E program, the Department of Energy's ARPA-E program. And that uh, test center, test platform will be a key part in that. So 
that, but like like many test centers around the world, uh, you know whether you know that um, you know there's there's a, a one up in Canada, there's a couple in Canada, uh, Scotland, Ireland, and other places. It, it's um, it's challenging to get those fully stood up. But I, I can tell you um, that you know that will be a key component to the um, the ecosystem. It seems so easy. The water's moving. Can we just convert it to electricity? What's taking so long? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, yeah, the problem is, right, yeah, the problem is that wave energy converter platforms yeah, are, um, as I've said, uh, for a number of years, they're, um, they're inefficient, you know, they're just wildly inefficient, uh, because, you know, sure. they, they, I yeah, know nothing yeah, about it, I'm yeah. sure it's much more complicated than, than what we think, um, yeah, but, yeah, uh, moving on here, uh, Carl has a question, I don't know, I think this is, might be sort of a rhetorical question, but, um, Oceans are in declining health. Um, no, this is a serious question. How can blue tech um, save us from extinction? Or, you know, how can blue tech help us reverse the tides, no pun intended, on yeah. the poor health of our oceans? Yeah, well, that's a good question, Carl. And, you know, that, and, and probably one that, that he's thought of um, carefully. But I, I think what we're... Yeah, what we're seeing today, and I think, you know, getting back to that question about the UN and the dialogue, the global dialogue around our oceans is, you know, really the oceans were looked at as a resource, you know, to be exploited, right? So that, that, that you know, food, you know, from fish to kelp to aquaculture. So it's where, you know, as the population grows, we just turn to the ocean and we, you know, pluck food out of it and, and that'll solve the food crisis. Uh, you know, defense, so whether it's the South China Sea or sovereignty issues in the Arctic, navigation issues in the Arctic with, the, you know, melting, uh, you know, ice caps and things like that. Um, but today we're now, again, because of this dialogue around climate and that the oceans impact climate and climate impacts the oceans, uh, we need to better understand the oceans. And so what we're seeing is companies, in fact, the company I'm meeting with this morning later uh, is developing a hydrogen I think Carl can appreciate this, you know, a hydrogen power system for a surface vehicle that will allow them to monitor, uh, you know, from the surface, uh, the oceans and do it in a, you know, a cleaner way that, that uh, doesn't, you know, introduce CO2 into the atmosphere. So it's, it's, it's you know, not ex exactly a solution, but it's what companies are thinking of today. And, and the other is, you know, frankly, with sensors, you know, like, like you know, um, in the Cold War, we would do things like dump. Uh, hundreds of thousands of sonar buoys that self-scuttled themselves into the North Atlantic, you know, for instance, and um, and those are all on the bottom of the ocean. And so when we think about, you know, kind of mm -hmm. how we treated the oceans before, it's just not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're going to see, um, you know, uh, like you know that um, uh, hull, you know, hulls, uh, casings, and uh, other developments that are using recycled or recyclable material, um, biodegradable material and things like that, that you haven't. So I, I, again, I frame these things up as opportunities, but, but there, you know, but there, there is both an imperative and some uh, urgency to, to all of it. Great, thank you. So this is another, uh, there seems to be a lot of questions about, um, you know, is there a need for, um, so Chris asked, another, asked a great question here. Um, and maybe there's a broader question, like for tech writers, for example, um, writing manuals, those oh, kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there like a place we can go to see like what's in need? Is there like, I don't know, is there a blue tech job board somewhere? Or how, how, how would folks from various industries engage in what the demands are specifically? Yeah, I, I've seen there, there are, um, yeah, that's the problem. There isn't sort of one blue tech job board. There are, yeah, you know, like the, the Maritime Alliance out in California has a blue tech job board. Um, there are uh, other groups uh, that I've seen with, you know, kind of blue tech job boards. Uh, the, the, to address Chris's specific question around tech writers. Yeah, I'm, I'm for instance, I'm working with a company right now and they, they, they absolutely, this isn't, uh, don't send your resume quite yet. Uh, but they will eventually need uh, tech writers to help them uh, in, you know, as they they commercialize this particular product. So, I I I, I just wrote it as an opportunity. Um, you know, there is an opportunity for uh, job board. It's not the Blue Venture Forum. We we haven't we've looked at you know kind of a specific aspect 
of blue tech, the challenges in blue tech, uh, but, but workforce development isn't one, but I think it's a good point and maybe one that we can add to um, you know, the to-do list, if you will. Great. So we've got four questions in four minutes. We'll do like a little bit of maybe a lightning <laughs> round here. Uh, okay. Jane, uh, Jane Ward, uh, Dr. Ward has a question here. With the focus on tech, with the focus on tech on or in the water, are any tech companies working on the challenging issue of water purification? In fact, I just saw the water report today, um, no. coincidentally enough. Um, purification, desalinization, improved technology for wastewater, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, APCC estimates that a third of our freshwater ponds on Cape Cod are contaminated, yep. um, so on and so forth. Um, right. Yep. Any, there's, yeah, there's, I, yeah, yeah, I know. I, uh, so on purification, I'm, I'm, I'm less sort of familiar with what's happening in, you know, sort of water and uh, yeah, uh, other than to say, you know, for the Cape, like wastewater and water, water is a big issue, you know, like, you know, for wastewater, you know, just from a infrastructure perspective, but from a purification standpoint, I'm less familiar with what's happening there. But from a desalinization standpoint, there are, I, I was a judge for the Department of Energy's Marine Renewable Energy uh, Collegiate Challenge, and some of these uh, wave energy converters things are looking at um, De, like like Resolute Marine, their technology is using wave energy to power desalinization plants. And so they're doing it right now. They've got a deployment in Cape Bird uh, and they've looked at other places to uh, uh, take the technology. But in my mind, desalinization plants aren't exactly a, you know, a full solution because it, they, they, anyway, the, but, um, but purification, I, I, I know that there's opportunities there. I just am less familiar with what is happening in that space. Does, does this feel like an area to you? I mean, I, this isn't my subject of expertise, but this seems like one of those areas of disorganization. So like I live in Dennis and it seems like a lot of these problems, the town says it's not our problem. The people don't want to pay for it. It's the state's problem. It's the federal problem. And it's like, no one sort of owns this sort of, is it? Is, do you think that's kind of contrib maybe contributing to what we're seeing? Well, ownership of yeah, I mean, you know, like, like again, I, I know enough about, I, having been involved, as you guys know, with, you know, sort of the Cape economy, you know, those, those EDA-funded initiatives years ago on the, on the Cape, and, and hearing some of the concerns about, and having been a Cape resident for a long time, um, you know, that, that it is a challenge because you've got, you know, municipal towns and, and cities or city uh, and then you've got, you know, sort of county, state, and um, and and federal issues uh, in play. That yeah, so I mean, it's a big challenge. Uh, that uh, the only thing I can say about it is, is it's a it's a, sort of a big recognized challenge. The the um, the, the 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 big challenge is who's going to address it, and I think that might be to your point, Taylor. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that. All right, so we've got a minute left and a couple of questions. Um... Judith put in a comment here. If you want to learn, if you have an interest in working with Climate Impact, Blue Tech, Blue, Blue Economy, um, please reach out. She put some information in here for anyone that's interested um, for the incubator. Um, Carl put in a comment. The UN is doing far more than promoting dialogue. They are leading the world in developing solutions to improve ocean health and possibly preventing our extinction. Um, I don't know if you want to sort of already talked about that. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, last question here from Chris. Does anyone present? Does anyone present think about micro or nano sized particles when at their favorite local fishmonger? I don't know what that particularly means. Um, like with mercury, is there a correlation between fish size and safety? Yeah. I don't, that I don't know if you have. Yeah. Comment. Yeah, well, mercury is kind of, you know, like, like you know, uh, mercury levels in fish have, have been, you know, that that's sort of been a thing for a while, understanding that there are certain fish species that have, you know, higher mercury levels than others, that mercury is an issue, and then there's plastics, the microplastics and, and other stuff in, in fish, and, and so that, I, I, can, I can say I know enough about the problem to know that it's a problem, but, but and the, uh, like on the plastic side, there are a lot of uh, both, uh, you know, uh, th there's particularly out of the uh, EU uh, firms that are looking, startups and, and others uh, that are looking to deal with the microplastics issue. 
I, I fr frankly don't know with other pollutants like mercury, for instance, um, I, I don't know what's being done to address it, but, you know, but, but security of the food chain, you know, so like, like, you know, get like some, I, I can tell you there are a number of groups. Judith is probably close to this, but there, there's a group called Sea Ahead. Maine, uh, there, there's a couple of groups in Maine, including this Maine venture capital group that's looking at funding companies that are looking at traceability and supply chain security in fish. And so, for sure, like you know, that like you know, again, the security and, and health of our the stuff we eat uh, is is important and will increasingly be important. And I know. Uh, again, not to sound mercenary, but I know investors are actively looking at solutions um, in that space. And, and like, again, the example I gave with onset, uh, onset sensors being dropped into these bags of oysters that are being harvested just so that they can trace. Um, you'll, you'll see that port into other things like, um, you, know, you know, enabling better, you know, the health of the oysters, the growth of the oysters, seeding of oyster beds and, and other stuff. So, um, that's not exactly an answer, Chris, but um, but de but definitely, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a concern, and and investors are interested in solutions. And if you have one, that's a great segue into wrapping up the meeting. the The moral of the story and the takeaway here is: there's an ocean of opportunities, big problems to solve, and thankfully, we have folks like yourself and the incubators. Um, Anything that we have an interest in, there's information here. We can go and learn more. We can check out the incubators. We can attend the symposium. And um, I know, at least for me, I'm very grateful there's folks like you around driving this initiative. And I want to thank you for speaking today as well. It was a really great presentation.